Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Bravo Research Baseline Basics webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, this is Sarah Collel uh, with Bravo AgriFinance Public Relations and Communications. Um, so over the last few weeks, you have received the first two reports in our baseline series from the Bravo Research Food and Ag team. It's our objective with these reports that they create a point of comparison that our clients can use for strategic planning and scenario analysis. When we introduced these reports, we offered a similar webinar for our bankers on what we were doing with this research, why and how the data can benefit our clients, and we wanted to do the same for you. So this morning, over the next half hour here, we will walk through our baseline, how we use it, and how our research can provide you with insights that you can use to, to inform your reports. So with that in mind, we have three panelists with us today from the Rabo Research Food and Agribusiness Group here in St. Louis. Sam Funk is a grain and oil seed analyst based here in St. Louis. Sterling Liddell is a global, is our, I think, global data, data analyst. And then Don Close is a senior animal protein analyst who specializes in the beef sector. Each person will walk through part of the baseline and provide a couple examples to illustrate our thinking. We won't delve into the baseline reports for each sector per se, but rather walk through what it is and what's available to you as a reporter from analysis perspective. Uh, we will, since it's a small group this morning, we will leave your lines unmuted. So if you have questions as we go along, um, feel free to ask them. Uh, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll have time to take questions as well. So I will start out by turning it over to Sam Funk to walk through our baseline and what it is. Sam. Sure. I appreciate that, Sarah. And good morning, everyone. As we're talking about a baseline, what's it's kind of a difficult situation. We've all heard probably about the USDA baselines and other uh, factors out there, but let's start off with just a real quick review for, for what is a baseline out through here. And I think one of the best examples that we can use for what is a baseline is to kind of look at an electrocardiogram, an EKG. So if you go to a doctor and you want to get a picture of what's going on, uh, hopefully they've been able to see you before you had some sort of an incident occur and they try to get a baseline for what does your heart rhythm look like. They want to see the peaks, they want to see the troughs, they want to know uh, how much distance there is between the peaks and the troughs, and they want to see if there's anything that they can tell first off from that baseline. It's very similar to an agriculture baseline that we're talking about. The first thing is, is to look at what have we been going through. So part of our baseline and most baselines is what have we had from the past? What has that data shown us? What is agriculture? What are some of these uh, the trends that we've been seeing look like. And then we want to try to say, okay, can we describe impacts in that baseline that we think are important things that we need to be able to analyze further or things that we need to be prepared for occurring going off into the future. And then really it's to say, okay, if something occurs out in that future, what do we think might be different from what we had in the past? What, what, what challenges might we face? What opportunities exist? And so it's kind of looking at both at the historical aspect and then also looking forward to saying, okay, if we project this out in the future for an agriculture baseline, where are we going to head as we go forward? It's almost like saying instead of an EKG, if you took it to a budget, how do I budget forward looking at this with all the occurrences that might happen? It was really important for us with Robo Research looking not only just at the sectors, but looking at it in mind of our clientele, what might happen with agriculture going forward and if we want to move forward and look at where we might be heading toward, it's really important for us to be able to describe what special circumstances might arise and to have access to a model that would allow us to look at this baseline and say, okay, compared to what we've seen in the past or what we might project that would be a continuation from where we're going forward, what might happen if we shock that model? So we're going to click on here to the next slide. So as we look forward to, to our baseline, we want to be able to say where are we at, what have we been to historically. So our baseline has a number of aspects on it, which we're looking at all of the trends, we're looking at several of the major drivers that have occurred, those factors that would change an industry, that would change a sector. 
in the dynamic relationship between several of these sectors, it's very difficult to separate out the, the corn sector from the beef sector. It's difficult to take uh, soybeans without talking about soybean meal and talking about what kind of feed stuff that might go into for the poultry or the pork sector and how that interacts with trade. But we really wanted to be able to have this model that, that allowed us to not have to depend on anyone else outside, but allowed us to put in some very rigorous relationships together built on a very accurate uh, amount of detailed information from different sectors that come together in an integrated format so that we can be able to say, here's what we project going forward. It doesn't take into account those things that are not foreseeable. It doesn't take into account uh, major geopolitical uh, things that aren't just involved in trends that we see. Um, it doesn't have weather shocks. What it does is it gives us, for the United States, the ability to estimate what's the likelihood of these weather shocks out through here given history and given other situations. And as we go forward then, we can say what is the most dynamic look that we have for the industries out through there so we can give a range of expectations for what we might face going off into the future. So as we come together, what our baseline analysis allows us to do is to take this very integrated cross-sectoral model that's been calibrated and say, here's what we project going off into the future based on what we've seen in some of the industry uh, trends and what our individual expertise for all of the analysts that we've got involved with this project to come together and say, here's what we expect going forward. When this model balances, it finds an equilibrium between supply and demand out through here for all these different crops and with all the different sectors and allows us to take some assumptions out through there and some sensitivities and be able to say, here's what we project going forward within this range and here's what we think the most likely is. Going forward from that then, aside with those projections, they allow us to say, as we move forward, where are we compared to what we projected? What were those changes that might have created those differences? And if we want to potentially say, let's shock this model with these type of changes, it allows us a scenario analysis where we can say this is what would happen, that we project would move us off of where we had this projection prior in our baseline. A baseline is simply that. It's that given aspect of what we say here's most likely given scenarios. Now, where could we go to? Okay. okay. So if, if we're going forward from that, then we want to be able to account for some of the volatility that might come in or some of those market conditions. And that's where we, where we give a, a range of assumptions with certain categories. We've got these statistical baselines where we can say this is what we would project for where we might land within uh, various ranges and what would drive us toward either a high end of a range or a low end of a range. But it, it's really something that takes into account a lot of historical yields we might have with crops. It might look at cattle cycles. It might look at herd size and growth. But a lot of factors coming in there and, again, trying to integrate them so we can look at those differences. And a lot of those factors allow us, as we said before, to shock this model and we can see how that shock might translate forward. Say it was a shock uh, with some examples we'll have later with ethanol, what happens in the cattle cycle, and that's one specific example. But there's a lot of things that it gives us more flexibility because we have this model here that we can independently go ahead and try to make these changes versus a USDA model that maybe you see twice a year. In this example, we can go back as often as we need within the sector to be able to analyze. Okay. I think Sterling Liddell, did you have a point? Oh, okay. Really, what we want to do now is to talk about how these can be used in industry. And so to kick off that, we're going to have Don Close come in. Good morning, all. Um, I've, talked with, I've talked with a number of you on the recent release of the Beef Baseline. So, so with some of you, I've had parts of this conversation. But with examples of how we can use this data if you look at the, the slide and it's got the, the four different probabilities, the, the red line there is, I'd say, a, a worst case scenario. If we get back into subst substantial drought environment, uh, the natural disasters, what happens under a worst case scenario? The, the brown light on top is the 95 percentile. I think that's a, that's a rose-colored glasses, the world is perfect perspective. 
an example I would give for that is with the opening of U.S. beef trade to China, and if that uh, trade were to develop at a much more robust pace and volume than what we're currently expecting, what could be the outcome to the overall market? I think both of that, the 95 percentile and the 5 percent percentile, really outside the box, but still within the realm of possibilities. Where we'll be spending the overwhelming majority of our time, <coughs> excuse me, between the, uh, the blue line and the green line is the 25 percent percentile, the 75 percent percentile, and I still think that uh, while this gives us a really solid foundation of the mathematics or probabilities of where the market will likely perform, it still has the need for incorporation of the science of economics and where do we see this all fitting together. Um, so that's one, exa one example of how we're using this data. The, uh, the, real, the real takeaway for me when we put, came up with this slide was we had the, uh, the low ebb mark on U.S. beef cows there in Jan 1 of uh, 2014 at 28.9 million. Uh, we've had three years of phenomenal growth. What these models show us is we're still seeing expansion in the cow herd. We think that cow expansion will continue through 2018, maybe up, to, up into 2019, before we see the backside of the cycle. The, the, the biggest beauty of this is, uh, w without a radical scenario, uh, we're still holding U.S. beef cow numbers above 30 million head. That, to me, is a really good signal for the industry long term. If we go then to the follow-up chart, and one point of confusion that we've had with the beef baseline report that we've released, while we're looking for the cattle cycle and beef cow numbers to peak in the 2018-2019 level, we're still looking for beef production to expand into 2021-2022. So there needs to be that differentiation between where numbers will actually peak or productive numbers peak and where the production of the offspring of those cows and where they fit into the market. One quick example of how this could be used is say we have a client that is a beef processor and they're looking at uh, are we warranted or justified in looking at building a new facility. If you started off this morning you went through a site selection process, you got that taken care of, you went through a permitting process, uh, then you had two to three years involved of building a new plant before it was fully operational. Would there be enough time to get that facility built before numbers have peaked and you're, now you have the cost of a new facility as, as total cattle numbers are starting to decline? That's an example of how we can project forward using this data as, as a baseline. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Sterling. Thanks, Don and Sam. Uh, great explanation. So Don gave us a good example of how this can be used in the industry. Um, there are a lot of other applications that we can see within the industry uh, using these baselines. And as Sam um, indicated in his remarks, uh, it's a fairly robust model that incorporates the elasticities or the relationships between all of the different sectors, and that allows us to do uh, additional analysis. So what do we get out of the baseline when we do the analysis? Um, first of all, just from a baseline perspective, we can look at the interactivity of different sectors within uh, the baseline itself. In this case, uh, we're looking at corn, soybeans, and wheat, and the competition there for acres going forward uh, gives us an idea baseline-wise. Now, this can be changed, and we can, we can impose different changes on this 
to see what the impact is, not say something happens on the corn demand side. It wouldn't just give us the impact of, on corn, but also the impact that, that demand would have on soybeans and wheat in this example. So this is one of the uses that we can have, and we will be using the model to do this type of analysis in the future. So when you hear us talk about baseline and changes from the baseline, that's what we're talking about is this type of a, a scenario analysis. The other thing that Don talked about was the, the probability part of the model. We incorporate into the model as much of the random uh, variability that we can and calculate uh, these random um, or, or the, these probable outcomes. This is a, a chart of pricing where we see corn price probability and soybean price probability over the next few years. That allows us to do uh, additional analysis in terms of where the risks are within the industry and, and what the potential uh, impacts could be. So Don's example of, uh, of a drought with the cattle herd on that 5% red line in cattle, what would the impact be on, for example, corn prices or soybean prices if that type of a drought happened? And so we're, we're doing those types of analysis within the baseline itself, but then we can impose scenarios to evaluate where, um, where these probabilities might change and, and where more risk pops up in the, in the different systems. So with that, we can do additional analysis from a, a um, scenario perspective. And when I say scenario, it kind, of kind, of kind of goes back to what Sam was talking about, changes geopolitically, uh, trade law, um, we can look at droughts, specifically impacts from other parts of the world. An example of that is a small analysis that we've done already looking at ethanol uh, usage. If ethanol were to, for example, increase by about 4 to 5 percent uh, usage of corn, what would happen to uh, the corn price and acreage? So the baseline would be that blue line on the bottom and uh, on the bottom of the uh, price chart there, the left-hand corner, and the green is the scenario. So as we look at what the change is, we see that there's, there's probably about a 30 to 40 cent increase in corn if that were to happen immediately in the 2018 and then 2019 season. Uh, where you'd see that impact on the price of corn. So we can evaluate what that means. Also, on the left side, we can see what that means for acreage. If we had that, that change, then we would go from about 90, a little over 90 uh, million acres, close to 91, to where we'd be consistently close to 92 million acres, at least in the near term. And acreage would be a little stronger in corn than the baseline expectation. Uh, exports would decrease slightly, and that's important as well. But now we don't need to just be limited because of the way the model is across everything uh, to looking at corn or what the impact and the demand for corn would be. For example, we can also look at anything else like cattle. If we had this increase in ethanol, this is the only thing that changed is that ethanol uh, be demanded four to about 4% more corn than it currently does. What's the impact on cattle? Well, we see it, first of all, having an increase or an impact on the beef cow herd. Uh, that's the, the top left-hand graph. That beef cow herd um, would liquidate quicker under this scenario where you have more cost pressure and less retention, and so you get a quicker um, movement to liquidate and also a little bit deeper movement to liquidate. Then below that, that means that you have uh, less fed slaughter coming out of the system because you're pushing it earlier because you go into uh, liquidation sooner and you see those animals coming off and you have less in the future. So this gives you some strategic uh, analysis around what happens with ethanol. Uh, then, from a beef production perspective, uh, the beef uh, peaks sooner be and higher uh, because you have that additional um, fed 
uh, slaughter coming into the system, and also you don't retain heifers all the way into the 2020 period. And so this gives us the ability to look at those types of scenarios and, and see what the impact is of changes in one to the other. We could have looked at any of the things being modeled for this particular example. And, and that's what we will be doing in the future as we uh, do this analysis. So it's hopefully our purpose today was to demonstrate that we, what the baseline is and why we did it, uh, why we've, we've spent so much investment in producing uh, this model so that we can actually do the analysis and provide uh, the strategic thought for, um, for each one of these sectors. Great. Thank you, Sterling. Uh, does anyone have questions at this point? Okay. Um, if you do, be sure to pipe up. Sterling, one question for you. H how often will these reports be updated and then redistributed? Is it on an annual basis or is it contingent upon different market factors? Um, Sarah, we will be updating the, the baseline uh, continually, actually, but uh, we'll be doing reports, update, re updated reports once a year. Um, where we update the entire baseline and we'll do uh, periodic updates uh, at half year. So it'll be a biannual when, when we'll actually adjust the, the official baseline. Um, but, and then beyond that, we'll be using the baseline to do a number of other uh, analysis as they as they are needed. Okay, so your baseline reporting will inform other reports that come from the group? And, and the baseline model will be the the, as Sam made the, the uh, uh, illustration, it will be the comparison for changes. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll ask again if anyone has questions that they'd like to uh, give, put forward to the group. All right. Again, um, it's really important to us that this information is something that you can use to inform your reporting. So if you are working on things in the future and our baseline or our projections might contribute to your story, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and I can connect you uh, with the appropriate team member at Ravo Research to hopefully provide another tool to your reporting to make it that much more robust. When, we, when we're looking out um, to the future, you've gotten the grain and oil seed and cattle and beef baselines in the next couple weeks, you'll receive a pork and poultry baseline. Left to come in 2017 are also um, North America baselines for Canada and Mexico, and we expect to have a farm economics paper as well before the end of the year. 2018, I think you all have cotton and potatoes and sugar in the pipeline, so, so again, just a really robust um, set of baseline reports coming your way. So again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you have questions, please reach out to me. And as always, I can connect you with one of our analysts for, for what you're re reporting on. So again, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sterling and Sam and Don, for the information. Have a great day.